Hello, my name is Jamie Rausch and I'm the Crime Analysis Unit Manager for the Jacksonville, Florida Sheriff's Office. Today we're going to begin a course discussing crime and intelligence analysis for commanders. In this particular course, we're going to discuss why crime and intelligence analysis should be something that you should be considering, what it actually is, if you want to do it or are already doing it, what the roadmap is for you to continue or to begin doing crime and intelligence analysis, and also what determines crime and intelligence analysis success. Even in an ever-changing world, what is successful when you actually implement crime and intelligence analysis? Welcome to Chapter 1. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about crime and intelligence analysis for commanders. And really this presentation is about the commanders that are in the room, the people who are seeing this particular presentation who really have to figure out about crime and intelligence analysis. Today we're going to talk about why crime and intelligence analysis, why it's something that you should consider, why it's something that is important in the law enforcement profession currently, what it actually is, what a lot of people are doing in different agencies across the country, but what it actually is when you look at um, what it should be and what you should be doing. For those of you who want to do crime and intelligence analysis, today I'm going to provide you a roadmap, a guidance to say these are the types of things that you should be considering. And then finally, I'm going to talk about what makes crime and intelligence analysis success. What are the things that make it successful in your organization? And not only something for today, but something that continues into the future as well. So starting out today, I really want to talk about why crime and intelligence analysis. Crime and intelligence analysis have been buzzwords within the law enforcement community for many years. The conversation was extended in September of 2008 when the International Association of Chiefs of Police, Police Chief Magazine, focused on crime mapping and analysis. In this first session, we're going to discuss why you should look into crime and intelligence analysis through a recap of its role in some common policing strategies. To start off, by definition, crime analysis, according to Dr. Rachel Boba at Florida Atlantic University, is the systematic study of crime and disorder problems, as well as other police-related issues, things that include socio-demographic, spatial, and temporal factors that assist in police in criminal apprehension, crime and disorder reduction, crime prevention, and evaluation. In essence, crime analysis is about using various types of data from a variety of different sources, some law enforcement and some not law enforcement, to really guide policing strategy and to determine the outcome of whether or not that is successful. Intelligence analysis, according to the International Association of Law Enforcement Intelligence Analysis, is information that is compiled, analyzed, and or disseminated in an effort to anticipate, prevent, or monitor criminal activity. As you will notice from these definitions, there are very few differences between crime and intelligence analysis. In essence, both functions are the use of data compiled in a variety of ways to assist law enforcement understanding and reacting to the criminal environment. Many common policing strategies use both crime and or intelligence analysis as their common foundation. To start, I would like to talk about ComStat. ComStat, a very familiar concept to most agencies, developed in the early 1990s. The process used real-time intelligence and information for focusing on problem areas in which people deployed resources. The outcome of that resource deployment was moved into accountability meetings to look at whether or not it was successful or not successful. Crime and intelligence analysts were central to the development of these comprehensive computerized statistics, hence the name ComStat. So again, crime analysts were an integral part of whether or not ComStat was something that was done in an organization and also to determine whether or not it was effective as well. Moving on to the next strategy, problem-oriented policing, is an approach to policing which different pieces of police business, different types of incidents, events, types of uh, calls for service, arrests, etc., that are subject to microscopic examination and use the skills of crime analysts to comb through that information to determine what is actually going on in a particular area or with a particular type of problem. It's from this analysis that problem-oriented policing places a high value on developing the responses that are preventative in nature, that are not dependent of the criminal justice system, and that really truly engage public agencies and the community in the reduction of problems. In essence, problem-oriented policing requires the fact that you have crime analysts doing the type of work to determine whether or not 
what is actually taking place and whether it is effective once responses are implemented. Moving on to the most, one of the most widely used different policing strategies, intelligence-led policing, according to Dr. Jerry Radcliffe, is a policing, is a business model and a managerial philosophy where data analysis, analysis and more importantly, crime intelligence are pivotal to an objective decision-making framework. And the goal here is to facilitate crime and problem reduction, disruption and prevention through both strategic management and effective enforcement strategies that again target prolific and serious offenders. At the core of intelligence-led policing is the idea that crime and intelligence analysis are interpreting the criminal environment, influencing the decision maker to impact that criminal environment, or what Dr. Radcliffe calls his three-I model. Intelligence-led policing is extremely important in the sense that crime and intelligence analysis help to ensure that decision making is actually done efficiently and effective for all outcomes of police work. One of the newest terms in, problem, in policing strategies is predictive policing. Predicting policing is about using data to inform police decision making. Again, a similar theme that you saw in the other three strategies as well. Predictive policing uses algorithms based on modeling of past events to develop probabilities for prediction of future events, really trying to figure out where events are gonna happen, not based on the past, but into the future. The probability of future events is used for resource allocation. Once you determine areas that need um, different types of approaches or whether there are gonna be events, then resources are devoted to those particular areas. Assessment and measurable outcomes of whether or not that resource allocation was effective is basically guided through crime reduction. So when you determine in an area is gonna have future events, devote resources to that particular area, then your outcome is based on whether crime reduction occurred in that particular area. This entire strategy requires crime analyst knowledge and experience to augment the predictive modeling that it's designed to. Crime analysts have a, quite a bit of internal institutional knowledge about the areas in which they work, the times of year where crime is most occurring, the types of places that occur where crime occurs disproportionately to others. This type of knowledge and experience should augment any type of predictive modeling. So in, in essence, crime analysts are required to be part of the predictive policing process as well. The place of crime or intelligence analysis in the policing strategies discussed focus around a similar theme, the use of data and analysis as a transformative process to better decision making. Any decision that you or I make with a, are made with a variety of influences. In our personal lives, it might be related to spouses, children, or other family related factors. But as we approach law enforcement decisions, we also have a variety of decision making influences. Some of these revolve around public opinion, what is actually going on, what people think about crime and how it is occurring. The media, the most recent articles, the events that are touched upon in the media, politicians, mayors, city councils, other organizations, people who have influence in the way that policing should be done or a thought about how policing should be conducted. Other police agencies, what a neighboring jurisdiction is doing for a particularly burglary problem may be part of your influential decision making. What crime and intelligence analysis brings to the table. Again, the use of data for determining what is actually occurring and how it should occur and what should be done using that data. Other government agencies, what other organizations are talking about in terms of what can and can't be done. Some non-governmental agencies or even organizations. In this particular case, you may even think about what's actually being done in the private sector, for example, and how that may affect your decision making. And then most importantly in law enforcement, we've always, what we've always done, the common thought of, we've done it this way for so many years, we should continue to do it that way. Okay, these are all influences that are part of our decision-making process in making law enforcement decisions. However, in times such as these, when we have tight budgets and tight uses of manpower, the use of data and analysis is something that is done through crime and intelligence analysis. And what ends up happening is it is more objective. 
Crime and intelligence analysts don't have a idea about how something should come out. It's the responsibility in their job to simply look at what is going on in the data and to make appropriate inferences to what is taking place. At the end of the day, they really just don't have a stake in whether or not a problem is looked at one way versus another. They don't have those influences. They're objective to what the data shows. It is progressive. Crime and intelligence analysis is something that is a progressive movement in modern policing today. It is something that's been done in many agencies for a few years now. However, it is forward thinking and it is adaptable to new policing strategies, as I just discussed about predictive analysis. Crime and intelligence analysts have institutional knowledge, which can be incorporated into predictive analysis. So even in the newest policing strategies, crime and intelligence analysis are part of the progressive movement of policing. And again, as I just discussed in our tight budgets and tight manpower times, the use of data to making decisions is defendable. It's not about what we've always done. It's not about the different types of issues that have been taken place. It is truly defendable using data. In essence, it really means that crime and intelligence analysis should become the key factor in your decision making. It should be the place that is moved to the center of your decision making in your organization. To close, really and truly, crime and intelligence analysis is clearly identified by all major policing strategies. It is something that is inherent in every one of the ones that I just discussed. Comstat, problem-oriented policing, intelligence-led policing, and then now the newest version of predictive analysis or predictive policing. Crime and intelligence analysis provide the link not only to identifying relevant data, but to truly cut conducting analysis, not just looking at data, but truly conducting analysis to make sense of the myriad of data, whether that be law enforcement data or whether that be data associated to non-law enforcement agencies, maybe data that's relevant within your jurisdiction. In the end, quality crime and intelligence analysts and their analytical capabilities lead to better decision making and efficient and effective policing strategies. That concludes chapter one. Welcome to chapter two.